All right, folks, it's time to get started with reloading for 6.5 PRC. Here's a piece of PRC brass with some 300 wind mag to its left and some 6.5 Creedmoor to its right. So the case is not much longer than the Creedmoor, about a hundred thousandths or so, but it's got the girth of the 300 wind mag, so short and fat. It holds, you know, roughly 10 grains more of powder than the 6.5 Creedmoor. So in Creedmoor, a lot of our charge weights are in the 40s, and with the PRC, they're up in the 50s. So the test rifle for this cartridge is going to be my Savage 110 Precision. I bought it chambered in 300 Winchester Magnum, and a viewer named Kyle sent me a Savage Factory 6.5 PRC barrel that he had pulled off of his. So big thank you to Kyle for the barrel. I did do a video about swapping the barrels, but with some of the videos I've had removed here on YouTube in the past, I just don't really feel comfortable posting it here. So if you want to see that, you can go over to my page on Rumble. I'll have a link down in the description for that. So where we're starting this video is with a gun that has obviously been swapped over. I've already fired it and tested it, shot a couple groups with some factory ammo, sighted it in, all that. So that's our starting point from today. Questions about how I got to here are answered in the video over on Rumble. I also need to say a huge thank you to, to Thomas, who sent me two boxes of factory ammo, a brand new box of nozzle brass, which brass is pretty much impossible to get right now. So this stuff's nearly priceless. And he also sent a whole bunch of once fired brass, 100 pieces of Hornady brass. So thank you very much to Thomas. Like I don't think I would be able to start the project right now if it wasn't for this. The brass is extremely difficult to find. So this 150 pieces he sent should be enough to keep us going for a good long while. So big thanks to Thomas. And don't let me forget my supporters on Patreon and channel members and Super Chat donators, Twitch subscribers. I sincerely appreciate all of the support. So today's video is going to be a lot like some of the others I've made whenever I'm getting into a new cartridge. I like to try a lot of different things. So I've pulled out 10 different bullets and 10 different powders. Got them all lined up here on the bench and we'll go through them in more detail here in just a few minutes. So the brass I've already covered. We've got some brand new nozzle brass. In the barrel swap video, we shot some factory ammo. So I've got some fired brass that was fired in my gun, Hornady obviously. And then we've got the brass that was fired in Thomas's gun. So that should give us some good variety to play with here during the resizing process because I want to load with all three, all three types we've got. So for dies, I ended up going with the Redding Master Hunter die set. And the main reason I did that is I have never, I have never tried one of their competition cedar dies. Yep, so this is the Redding Competition Series. So it's obviously micro adjustable. And it's got the little spring loaded chamber type setup that, you know, holds your case in alignment during the seating operation. A lot like the, the Forster ultra micrometer seating dies that I've used quite a bit. So looking forward to trying this guy. We'll tear it apart and have a closer look when we get to our bullet seating operation. So this kit comes with a neck sizing die and a full length sizing die. And these are standard dies. These are not the bushing type dies. These have got a standard expander ball. So if we compare this master hunter set, to one of the standard Redding Deluxe die sets. As far as I know, the only difference is you get the fancy cedar where this one comes with a standard seating die. Now these kits are pretty darn expensive. The last few cartridges I've, I've gotten into, I've just been buying Hornady custom grade sets or sometimes some RCBS sets. And these work, work really well. I especially like them because you can buy uh, seating stems. This is a, a six millimeter seating stem, but you can buy different seating stems for different bullet shapes and stuff. So just, just throwing that out there. Now this die set does come with a big, big warning. It says it is not suitable for seating bullets over compressed loads of powder. Doing so may crack the free floating cedar and score the sliding sleeve, rendering them both unusable, which is exactly the problem I had with a lot of the Forster ultra micrometer seating dies I was mentioning a few minutes ago. I've cracked a lot of the seating stems in those. So I guess we'll just have to be careful with this one. So I think that's most of what we need to talk about. Like this is extremely straightforward reloading as far as the procedure goes and the process and whatnot. I don't really expect any surprises. So let's go ahead and look at the load data. I wanna shoot all the way from the 85 grain Sierra Varminer, which is an extremely light bullet for 6.5 millimeter, all the way up to the 147 grain Hornady ELD match. Now there are some even heavier bullets that have come out over the last few years. 
that I just don't have on, on hand to test. There's like a, there's 150 grain Sierra Match King I want to try. There's 153 grain Hornady A-Tip and there's a heavy burger 156 or something like that. So eventually I'll get around to playing with some of those heavier bullets, but this barrel does have a one and eight twist and I'm not sure if we'll run into any stability issues. We'll see how the 147 grain ELD match does today. Now just looking at the bullets first and kind of going through the list and picking out the ones that are interesting. They're all interesting. That's why I picked them. I've had a lot of success with some of these in the past. A couple of them are, it'll be my first time trying. Mainly the 135 grain Hornady ATIP. I haven't shot that bullet before, but most of the list are, you know, they're old favorites. We've had success either in 6.5 Creedmoor or 6.5 Grendel. So we've got a quality bullet lineup. On the powder side of things, nine of the 10 are exactly what you would expect. These are the exact same powders we use in 300 Winchester Magnum. And then with some of the lighter bullets, we get a little bit faster, like IMR 4451 with the 107 grain Sierra Match King. But there is one oddball, and that is accurate, accurate 5744. This is an extremely fast burning powder. I originally bought this powder for 300 blackout. It is much faster burning than anything else we're shooting today. But whenever I started looking for load data, over on the Hodgson website, I saw this pop up as an option for the 85 grain Sierra Varminer that we're shooting today. And also the 100 and, hang on, I can't remember which one it was. It's either 143 or the 147. Yeah, so they've got load data for the 147 grain Hornady ELD match with accurate 5744. Now, reduced loads are not uncommon. And there are a couple powders that are really good at it. And I've heard that 5744 was one of them. It even says it right here on the bottle. Low bulk density and superior ignition characteristics make 5744 an excellent choice for reduced loads in many rifle calibers and in large capacity black powder cartridges such as blah, blah, blah. But what stuck out to me in the load data for the 85 grain Sierra Varminer is this is the highest velocity option. They show accurate 4350, accurate 5744, and accurate Mag Pro and this gets the highest velocity. I have no idea how that's even possible. Just look at the max charge weights. Max charge 5744 is 42.8, and the other two powders are 62.8 and 69.3 respectively. So this is 20 grains less powder than something a little more normal for the application, and we're still getting full velocity. I gotta try this out. Like I just, I have to try this out. So that's why you'll see the charge weight Looks a little bit goofy, right? We're shooting 40 grains of 5744 with that bullet. And then all of our other charge weights are in the mid 50s, 50 something grains. Now, low data availability is really good. The Sierra manual has lots of data. The Hornady manual has lots of data. The Hodgson website has lots of data. The Nozzer website had some good data. So I was able to find exact recipes for almost all of this stuff. There were a couple where I was off on my own Oh, the other one's Vitavori. So like 135 grain A-tip with Vitavori N565. That data is from the Vitavori website. So the 140 grain Spear Gold Dot that we're shooting with 54 grains of Reloader 26. I just made that up looking at other 140 grain bullet charge weights. The 123 grain Lapua Sinar, I didn't have any data for. The Vitavori website only went down to, I think, 130 grain bullets, and that would have been the most likely place to get data for a Lapua bullet. So for that one, I'm, I'm using Sierra Match King data. And I think it was the same way with the burger, the 130 grain burger hybrid. So just, you know, double check my work here. Like I mentioned, there's no shortage of, you know, of load data out there. So you can rely on and consult better sources than just some jack wagon on YouTube. So the standard maximum overall length for this cartridge is 2.955 inches. That's Sammy Max. The Savage 110 Precision has a big, huge magazine. So we're totally good to go as long as we need to. But looking at a lot of the jump numbers, it doesn't look like we need to. The really light bullets, the 85 and the 107 are going to have, was that 178 thousandths of jump and then 115 thousandths of jump. Some of those are just because, you know, the bullet's too short. We couldn't go longer if we wanted to because we need to maintain that contact between our bullet and the neck of our case, right? There's only so far we can go. But as soon as we got to the 120, 
And from there on up, our jump numbers are, are pretty reasonable. So you'll see most of them are right at that 2.955 or just a little bit shorter. So this seems like a good starting point. Now I did go ahead and buy a Hornady modified case that screws onto this tool. You drop a bullet down in there and there's a plastic plunger that allows you to move it to move it forward. So we put this in the chamber, then we push this forward until we feel the bullet hit the rifling. Then we tighten it down here, pull it all out. The bullet's usually jammed in the lands and you got to use a cleaning rod or something to break it free, but you put it all back together. Then you take your maximum overall length measurement with the tool. These are fiddly and a pain in the butt and it takes a lot of, a lot of feel. You got to take a lot of measurements to make sure it's reading correctly and that you got the bullet pushed all the way in and all of that. So that's where those, that's where those jump numbers are coming from. So for primers, I'm using federal GM 215 M's and that's kind of our plan. So first step in our loading process will be to prep our brass, to resize our brass. Let's do that. So the first four rows here, these 20 pieces are the previously fired brass that Thomas set. So this stuff is in perfect condition but it was fired in his rifle and it will not chamber in my gun. We tried it in the barrel swap video. So this needs full length resized. So I wanna go ahead and spray some lube on these 20 pieces so they've got some time to dry while we're messing with the other stuff. I'm gonna use this RCBS case slick. This stuff works pretty good. I've had luck with Hornady One Shot. I've had luck with homemade lanolin lubes. This stuff right here, Imperial sizing dye wax works well. So a lot of ways to lubricate the cases, but a couple spritzes with this stuff. Flip it around. Try and make sure and get the angle right so that I get a little bit inside of the necks. And we'll sit that aside to dry. Now back to the rest of our brass, we've got 15 pieces of the brand new nozzle brass. And the majority of the time, whenever I'm loading new brass, I go ahead and run it through a full length sizing die, just like we're gonna do with that other batch that we just, uh, that we just lubricated. Sometimes necks will be dinged and bent and whatnot. And it's important to get those rounded out again. And I usually use the full length die just in case, you know, just in case the new brass isn't quite small enough for my application. Now this new brass fits no problem in my chamber. Tried multiple pieces of it. And also with this nozzle brass, they sell it as fully prepped and ready to load. See case mouths are chamfered and deburred, visually inspected and weight sorted, and even the flash holes are deburred. So I've always heard that nozzle brass is made by Norma, which Norma is good brass. So nozzle is kind of like buying Norma that's already had that junk done to it. Now I want to go ahead and resize these necks, even though, you know, like I've just mentioned, it's probably a waste of time. Now the last 15 pieces are the brass I collected that was fired in my gun. So this came out of my gun. It will go right back into my gun. It's actually perfectly sized for my chamber now. So our die kit came with a neck sizing die. So let's just go ahead and neck size this just to try out the die. I don't do a lot of neck sizing generally, always full length resize, but we've got a shiny new die. We might as well give it a try. So since we're only using the neck sizing die on this brass, I want to use some Imperial dry neck lube. This is a powdered lube that goes in this little application media and we just, you know, dunk it down in there a couple times, tap off some excess. And that's probably a little too much excess. So that's, that's the lube we'll use with, with this brass and the, uh, the next sizing die, a little bit easier to clean up. You know what, I almost forgot. So these are the decapping and expanding assemblies from the two dies. They're, they're interchangeable, they're basically the same thing, but you'll see they look very different. Yeah, this one on the left is Redding's carbide expander, and this is the standard one. So we'll use the carbide expander ball in both dies as we go. So let's start out with the neck die and the expanding and decapping assembly. We just screw it down until the decapping pin is sticking out far enough, which is important because some of the fired brass we're about to resize still has the primers in them. So I'm using the RCBS Rebel press today. Got my shell holder, which is the same as the one for 300 Winchester Magnum. It's my RCBS 
number four shell holder. And we can lift the ram and then screw the die down until it touches the shell holder. Get my dry neck lube ready. And that first one we already lubed, let's run it up in there and see. See how it feels. Very little resistance. I did hear the, the primer drop, at least I think so. So looking at the dry lube, it's easy to see we didn't touch the shoulder. Just wipe that off, but the neck got sized down. So very easy neck sized piece of brass. I felt almost no resistance as the case was going up in there. I, I didn't lube this one. I want to try without lube here. Get to this point, like I feel the decapping pin touch the old primer. So if I overcome that a little bit, it goes up in there very easy. And then on the way down, you'll feel it pull over that carbide expander ball, just like that. So I want to see if I can uh, make my way through these without adding any additional lube. There's just not much work going on here. So I was just taking a quick measurement around the neck. So there's a fired piece that's 297, and then we run it through, and now I'm getting 290. All right, this is the last piece of the brass that was fired in my gun, no problems. Looks like we got a good neck size. So same die setting, I'm not gonna to touch anything. Now we're on to our new nozzle brass. And you know what, I better, better throw a little bit of lube, at least on this first one. And see, you know, how much work it feels like is going on. Doesn't feel like much of anything. And exact same look on that one. Wipe that off and we're good to go. All right, last piece with the neck sizing die. Now, moving on to the full length sizing die, things are going to get a little bit more complicated. Go ahead and switch over my expander ball, my carbide expander ball. All right, so I've got my Hornady headspace comparator with the 420 bushing in there. So if I take a piece of brass that was fired in my gun, I'm getting 1.645. So that's the base of the brass up to the shoulder. If we take a piece of the brass that we need to full length resize, I'm getting the same number, 1.645. So what that's telling me is that the brass that Thomas sent us, it's not fitting in my gun, not, not because of headspace, but because of some other dimension here. Now I'd like to set up our full length sizing die so that we bump the shoulder here until we're seeing 1.644 or 1.643. So one or two thousandths of shoulder bump will probably be enough. And hopefully in that process, the full length die will also size the body wherever it's needed to fit in my gun. So I've got the gun here so we can check things as we go. Let's screw the die down until it touches the shell holder. And we'll see what that gets us. Just lightly touching the shell holder. Holy moly, that's taking a lot of force. I can already tell that is taking a ton of force. So let's just keep going and let's pray that the, the RCBS K-Slick lube, oh yeah, something's wrong here. That's not going. Let me see if I can get it to come down. Come on, baby. Come on. Oh, crap. So this situation's always fun. We can't call it a stuck case yet. A case isn't stuck until you rip the rim off of your, off of your brass. And it's stuck. Well, poopy. Poopy. 
Okay, so I finally found my RCBS stuck case remover. This is my preferred way to deal with these. You can put something together yourself if you've got some stuff laying around, but this kit works nicely. The basics of it are, you know, step one, we drop this decapping pin out of the way. And with this case, we're gonna have plenty of room to work with. So once it's loose and dangling, I mean, you know, we're, we're an inch below where we were, which is important because next step is going to be to drill out our primer pocket. And once that's drilled out, we're gonna tap it. It's just a quarter 20 tap. And then once it's tapped, we'll be able to set this over top of it, thread into the piece of brass and it'll pull it right out. So let's do that. Man, I'm afraid, I, I think I may have just bent the decapping pin. Like this was just dangling like this and then it fell off my bench. So if it landed the wrong way, something might've got bent because I can't, I can't get it to come back through the flash hole. Oh man. Okay. Trying to, trying to thread this up from the bottom. So that's usually what happens. You gotta be really careful here not to put too much pressure because if the bit falls down, it's gonna crash into your decapping pin. So I was going really slow with light pressure and it just punched through and it, and it caught the bit. So a couple more twists to clean it up. And we should be good. So I've done this many times by just grabbing this with a pair of pliers and twisting it. These sorts of lock rings with the, yeah, that screw down onto the threads, these things suck. The pinch style, like this, this is a Forster or Hornady's are this way. It's just, just does a better job. Okay, let's see if that works better. So this, this part right here, a lot of people will use a socket and a, and a washer or, you know, just figure something out to handle this part. Man, that doesn't want to budge. See if I can get a handle on it. There it goes. I keep checking to see if I've got something wrong because this thing's not wanting to break loose. You know, as long as we can move our decapping assembly, we're not tightening down onto it, which is bad. Let me just keep cranking. Like it keeps moving. It's just not wanting. Okay, that was a gross noise. I don't like that noise. It definitely didn't come out yet, but I'm getting nervous. I've never had one this tight, I don't think. Like the way that's tapered, it should, it should be fine. It's sitting right there. I'm afraid this bolt's too long. I'm gonna go, I think I've got, I should have some 20, uh, quarter 20 hardware somewhere. Maybe this short little guy would be good enough. Well, I, I forgot to bring up a socket. Why didn't I bring up a socket? Can't tell if it came out or not. Yeah, looks like it. Oh, I see what was going on. Or not the whole time. Like once I had it loose, it wasn't, once it started pulling the case up, I ran out of slop here and it basically started pulling the case over the expander ball inside of there. So I need to see if I can get this Thread it in, I guess. Because, you know, we're not really done. We've still got the decapping assembly stuck inside of the of the brass. So I got my Dremel tool. We're gonna to need to cut it open one way or another, but I wanna make 100% certain the brass is free. So 
So now that it's loose, I should be able to loosen up the lock ring. Might actually be able to put the lock ring on the bottom. Let's try this. So the brass is still way down in there, but maybe that'll give us enough, enough room to pull it a little farther. Let's go back to the long bolt. Okay, I think that did something. Maybe. Okay, good. So now I can move the brass by hand and I know that it's totally free. So I wanna take the Dremel and try and cut the case head off now. I've never successfully pulled brass off the expander bowl. I've always needed to do something to cut the brass open and get the, get the expander out. So maybe there's something I'm missing that I just don't understand. Okay, so there we are, I guess, but this is kind of weird. I think it's so like, so whenever I try and screw the decapping pin up this way, I hit a lot of resistance. I'm trying to, I guess the expander ball is in the beginning of the neck, perhaps. So this might take some, this might take some force. I don't, what am I using these for? It's like I've got this thing cross-threaded. I don't know how in the world I would have done that. Well, like I just don't understand what's going on here. I'm wondering if, it, if it's that floating carbide expander ball. It's kind of jammed in the neck. Like, I've never had one give me problems like this before. Whatever. I just want to keep cranking. It's definitely, like, it's moving uh, smoothly. It's just tough. It takes a lot of force. Here's a, here's a 22 caliber pin with that same thing on there. Oh, what a mess. What a complete mess. Man, I haven't had one this fun in a while. Listen, I stick a lot of cases. Screw it, I'm just gonna keep cranking. It seems to be getting easier. Yep, and I think we just ran out of travel. I'm like properly screwed right now. What, what I need to do next is unscrew this. So if I can unscrew this in there, get my freaking garbage crap camera to focus. I'm not in a good mood right now. If I can get that broke loose, then the pin pulls out and the expander ball comes off. And then we can drive this out of the way. I, I mean, I think what's happened is I traded one problem for another. So first issue was the expander button was stuck in the neck a little bit and all that cranking had to overcome that. Somewhere along the way though, my piece of brass that was loose earlier is now no longer loose. Yeah, so the brass is stuck now. I don't know how to get a, I'm not sure how to get a hold of that thing. What I should probably do is stop and go get some food because I'm quickly getting angry. I'm not going to make it onto the range today and tomorrow it's supposed to be blowing 50 and raining and storming. So right now too much of that's going through my head.
Like instead of focusing on the issue, I'm thinking about the big picture. So I'm going to go get some food and then I'm going to come back and we're going to, we're going to freaking laser focus on getting this stupid thing apart. Okay. I think I've got an answer right here. I remembered these. This is a pair of needle nose that I had grinded down the last time I was trying to get into a tight spot and grab something small. I don't think I had the camera running, but a minute ago, so this is the decapping pin and you can see it just slips in and out. So I was able to pull it out. And then as soon as I sat down with these pliers, I started being able to rotate this. So hopefully this cap should come out and then our carbide expander should come out as well. Okay. There's that. Please come out. Please come out. It came out. Sweet. So now what we're left with is just a pin. I mean, we could basically drive it out. Here's the same thing on this 22 version with these, these parts removed. That's all that's left. But I'm hoping maybe once I back this back off, it'll just, it'll just come free. I don't know. Let's find out. I'm going to try and put the lock ring on the bottom. Okay. Hopefully that'll hold. All right, it's getting pretty easy now. That's a good sign. Not quite. Got a little cocky there for a minute. It's free. It looks like it did get cross threaded at some point. Yeah, those first couple threads are a little bit jacked up. Okay. Now the question is, can we get this piece of brass out of here? All right, let's try something stupid. It's like this pair of pliers can get a hold pretty good of the side of the brass and then we'll just try and nope. There's gotta be a better hammer around here somewhere. doesn't seem to be screwing anything up. So I'm just going to try and try and continue. Okay. We'll pull out the die and reassess the situation. So I think I've got it. I was looking through my punches and stuff to see about what size I might need. Cause I've, I've got some brass drifts. I was going to go see what I could find. Well, I was just kind of, just kind of testing out this little guy and slid it down in there to see if I could feel the top of the brass. And when I thought I had it, I just gave it a couple taps and I could feel the brass starting to go. There it went. So what do you think? Our first piece of resized 6.5 PRC brass. We're off to a fantastic start, aren't we? Oh, what a mess. What a freaking mess. All right, now I need to assess the damage to the die. So this assembly, I chewed it to pieces with, it is what it is. Even had the vice grips out. I'm not really concerned because, right, we have the second one. We just had one that was carbide and one that was regular. Well, our carbide, our carbide button is fine. That thing's totally fine. And this little guy that screws into the front, it doesn't matter if it's a little bit boogered up. It doesn't touch anything. All it does is hold hold the decapping pin. So I think we're in a recoverable situation here. I wasn't sure we were going to get there, but it looks like we have. I need to get some paper towels. I want to wipe this down and see if I screwed up the body. Main damage was with the Dremel tool. The Dremel tool took off and did some crazy stuff a couple times and I got a few scratches right there. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. I think we're okay. Cause I don't think anything touched kind of like the inside chamfer of the die. That all feels good. Looks like the camera's got a better view of it right now than my eyes. Let's we'll see if I can see any scars on that, that shiny inner taper. Looks okay, I think. Okay, holy crap. I think we're back in business. I got everything cleaned up. I got the carbide parts moved over to the assembly from the next sizing die. So this should be good to go. So we're, yeah, we're back to where we started. A couple different ways to go from here. And I'm trying to decide which one to do. So... 
Let's run a brand new piece of brass through this die. So the brand new piece of brass should be nice and small and go in and out of here, no problem. Then we'll try fired brass from my gun and then go back to the batch. You know, we just, we just stuck only after the other two work. Another thing, I, I didn't actually clean out these dies before I used them. I'm not sure why I didn't do that. So maybe there was some sort of manufacturing residue or something on there that caused all of our problems. I doubt it. All right, brand new piece of brass. I'm gonna leave the decapping and expanding assembly out of the die. That way, if we do get another one stuck, I can just go get a punch and we can punch it out. Gotta build our confidence first before we bring an expander ball back into the picture. Okay, lightly touching the shell holder. I'm gonna use Imperial Sizing Die Wax. This is the lube I have the most confidence in, and I'm really gonna, really gonna lube it up. And got a nice thick coat of lube. Let's see what happens. That took a hell of a lot of force for a brand new piece of brass. Come on out of there. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. You have got to be kidding me, come on. Oh, kill me. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Something is wrong with this die, right? Like, listen, I I've made a whole YouTube channel out of doing something stupid. Like, what could I be doing that's stupid? Man, I really don't want to screw up this brand new piece of brass. She's in there. All right, lifting now. Yeah, it's stuck. It's absolutely stuck. Well, that didn't seem to help. Oh. So I've really screwed it up now. Using a decapping pin in there so it would stay centered in the flash hole. And then I was just using a little punch and it slipped. And now my threads are probably boogered. We'll figure out the damage later. I need a bigger punch. Or I guess now that the case is ruined, I could just go with something a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, that fits down in there nicely. Probably just need a bigger hammer. Got it. Yeah, this is a this is a 6.5 PRC die. Just check. So, a brand new piece of brass should not do this should not be getting sized that aggressively. This brass already fits perfectly good in my gun. Let me grab my little bore scope and we'll have a look inside of this thing. Okay, let me try and get the world right in here. Here are my Dremel scratches. I guess we could look at this lip a little bit closer here. Not that it even matters. All right, let's go into here. I haven't really looked inside of enough dies to know whether this, this amount of tooling marks is normal or good. It's like I've definitely got a couple brass boogers laying around, laying around in here. And the whole thing's vaguely brass colored. 
Yeah, a lot of brass color in there. This is my Hornady 6mm arc die. It's not exactly polished either, is it? Alright, let's switch back to... Okay, 6 arc, 6.5 PRC. 6 arc, PRC. So we've got the remnants, you know, the one we cut. This was all the way up in the die. So let's take a couple measurements. I'm going to put it right here next to a, a new piece. I'm going to mark a couple spots that we could com can compare. Hopefully that, yeah, there we go. So whenever I got down to this measurement here, the numbers got weird. I think it was from all the bends and stuff I caused here. But the other four spots were fine. And I compared them to new brass, brass that was fired in my gun, and the fired brass that I was sent. If I can come up with some way of displaying this on the screen, you'll see that the, the case that was stuck in the die, the one that actually got resized by our new die, is it's smaller in the third and fourth measurement than even the new brass. So up around the shoulder seems fine, but the, f the closer we get down toward the base, it seems like this die is just too small. So we're not going to waste any more time on this die in this video. I'll probably call Redding and see what they have to say, but at the very least we could bring in some abrasives and at least try to polish it, right? I mean, maybe that would help. I, I did a little bit of research and there are definitely some widespread resizing problems in this cartridge, but it seems to be usually after, after three or four firings, the, the base just gets too big and sizing dies aren't able to size the, the case enough to get them to continue to chamber. So a lot of people complaining about that, but nobody sticking cases like I am. You know, maybe that's what's going on. Maybe they've gone with a, a smaller and smaller dimension toward the base as a response to complaints or something. I'm not sure. I'll figure it out eventually. But for now, I just need to get going with this video. So what I've got here now is 35 pieces of our new nozzle brass and then the 15 that we sized earlier that have already been fired in my gun. So I need to set the, the next sizing die back up and run through the new ones I added, and then we can finally move forward. I'm ready to move forward, man. Th this was not one of those fun problems that I enjoy working through. Like this has kind of been hacking me off. So let's get back on track. So I finally have 50 pieces of brass sized and ready to go. So after sizing, now is the time we would want to trim if trimming is necessary. The max case length is 2.030. So I like to open up my calipers and just kind of lock it down there. If I'm wanting to, you know, check a lot of them quickly and then just use it as a gauge and you can slide them through pretty quickly and they're all under max, which is all I'm, which is all I'm checking for here. It's the same deal. I have gone through and checked all 50 of these. The, the new brass is a little bit shorter than the fired Hornady, which is to be expected, but they're all less than max and that's good enough for me today. Have a look at this guy. See if we can see anything here. Oh no, that's not good. Let's see if it'll spread open. Might just be a crease, not really a crack. Funny thing is I didn't notice this during sizing, but when I was wiping off the lube, I just felt a little something and had a closer look. This is the point where I should make a joke about their uh, visual inspection, but we're just gonna, we're just going to move on. So the last thing I want to do with these before we start priming is just make sure the, the case mouths are cleaned up. Since we haven't trimmed, these just need uh, touched pretty lightly to make sure the, yeah, make sure everything's clean and nice and smooth. This can actually make a big, a big difference during bullet seating. A nice smooth chamfer makes everything, makes everything better. So this new nozzle brass already has the case mouths cleaned up. So same sort of deal, just wanna hit these lightly as well. So I just got a good night's rest and sitting down here to get started, I thought, I, I wanna look at that load data for Accurate 5744 one more time. And specifically, I wanted to see what primer they used. And they used the Remington nine and a half, which is a standard large rifle primer. It's not a Magnum primer. There's a there's a Remington nine and a half M for Magnums. and and they also had other loads that were using the, the GM-210M, which is the standard large rifle primer. I, I just assumed 
Like I wasn't paying attention. I just assumed this cartridge used Magnum primers. So that's what I had grabbed. So almost made a really big uh, mistake. I would say embarrassing mistake, but I mean, it's embarrassing what I told you about it. So it's still embarrassing. It's probably not the sort of mistake that would have blown my face off, especially like the, the loads I'm shooting today are well below max and probably gives us enough margin for an error like this. But hey, we caught it, right? That's, that's what matters. I'm a ding dong, but I caught it. So let's get rid of these guys and we'll switch to the 210M. I don't have any Remington nine and a halfs. I've got some, uh, some Federals, I've got some CCIs and I've got some Winchesters, but I don't have any Federals or, or uh, I don't have any Remingtons. So it will be good. I did check the Sierra manual uses Winchester. Yeah, Winchester WLRs and the Hornady manual uses the 210M. So that's our next step. Let's get our primers installed. If I can find my primer, got, got quite a pile going here on the bench. That's what happens when I run into problems and I'm using a bunch of tools. They just all end up piling up. That's fine. We'll clean that up later or, or probably not. It'll just stay there for like months and months. So I'm using the RCBS uh, universal hand priming tool. I keep one of these around set up for large primers and one set up for smalls. And I always seem to prefer these mainly because there's no parts, there's no shell holder, there's no anything. You just grab it and prime real quick, which appeals to my lazy nature. So I just picked up the first piece of my fired brass and was looking at that slightly crusty primer pocket. There's a whole variety of tools for dealing with this, including this little RCBS brush. So I guess I could take a minute to just clean them out a little. Nothing crazy, just getting the gunk out of there. And then prime them. That felt good. The pocket didn't feel loose at all. It's like my depth is okay. Just a little bit below flush and that'll work. So as soon as I start weighing powder, I'm going to start seeding bullets. So while the scale finishes warming up, I'm going to go ahead and tear this thing apart clean it up, see how it works. Okay, so there's nothing too complicated. It seems like this upper micro adjust assembly, I assume there's a screw head down in that hole to take this apart, but it doesn't seem necessary. It's just its own little thing. One thing I was looking, which, you know, it, maybe it does need torn apart and calibrated because the lines on the scale don't match up. So like, you know, we're at zero, we should be on a line, right? And if I take it down one turn, I guess it's just, this is just a little bit high, really doesn't matter. So here's the main sliding body. You know, it's got a, looks like a chamber down in there. Our brass is gonna, well, it'll be, you know, like this. Our brass is gonna go up in there. It's gonna be supported reasonably well and held in place during the seating operation is the basic idea behind these things. And then on the top end, we've got the seating stem. So this is the seating stem that came in the die. They do sell a VLD stem in each caliber, I need to go ahead and pick up the 6.5, might as well have it. But this is very, a very nice tight fit in here and it just you know, slides right down in. So very close fit, very little, very little movement here. So back to their warning where they talk about compressed loads. It says doing so may crack the free, free floating cedar and score the sliding sleeve render, rendering them both unusable. And that's exactly what I've done to some of my Forster dies, which the design's quite a bit different, but it's the same principle. So once the seating stem cracks and spreads open, then you're boogering up the inside of your cylinder as well. So that's pretty much it. Die body, not much in there. And this slides in the top, followed by the spring and the micro adjuster. So looking at the setup instructions, it does say that further disassembly of the micrometer is not necessary and it should not be lubricated. The hole in the top of the micrometer barrel is not an oil hole, they warn. So as far as installation instructions go, they say to raise the ram, and we're gonna screw this down until you know the ram's gonna make contact with this part and then squeeze it up. We just need to make sure that it's not bottom, bottoming out on the die body. So I screwed it down until it touched. Then it says to just back it out until you can read the micrometer. So one thing I wanted to look at was the seating stem fit with our with some of our bullets. 
Okay, this is our smallest bullet, the 85 grain Sierra Varminer. Certainly not perfect, but there seems to be a pretty, pretty big contact patch maybe. So next is the 130 grain burger and that fits like a glove, feels pretty good. And here's the 142 grain Sierra Match King. That also seems to be pretty good. So we'll just see how it goes. So what I'll be on the lookout for, or let me press this one a little bit harder. So we got a little bit of a, a ring around the bullet there, right? Where, where our primary contact was made. You just wanna make sure that doesn't start deforming the ogive of the bullet. I can live with a little bit of scuffing, but if we've got a big ring, that's bad. When your loads aren't compressed, it's usually not a big deal. Okay, so I've had my scale on for about a half hour to warm up and I wanna run some check weights through it. That's 20 grains. Here's 20 more. Here is five more. Seeing a 10th off there, that's fine. Here's 10 more. It'll usually straighten itself back out on that very next one. Two more. Or sometimes if you just let it sit for an extra second or two, it'll, it'll figure itself out. Or if you pick off the pan and put it back down. It eventually gets there. Let's see, two more. And one more. So looking good enough for me today. So our first load is 40 grains of accurate 5744. So I'm gonna dump some out. I'll probably scoop these straight out of the container. So this is really kind of a dangerous time. I've got all the other powder off the bench and I'm just gonna be careful as I go from powder to powder, from, you know, from charge weight to the next charge weight, constantly checking the paper notes that are right here in front of me. Cause it's easy, it's easy to get distracted, get confused. And I want to avoid that, like hitting my tripod with the wheel of my chair. The biggest tip I can give with, if you're using a cheap scale like this, is to put the empty pan on it a lot, like often. So I've got a big lee scoop here. Let's see if we can weigh out 40 grains. A little bit over. I mean, I could pull out a trickler, but since I'm only doing five loads per powder, it seems like a waste. All right, I think I've got the adjustment up high enough. So our target overall length is 2.620. Okay, I don't think the seating stem is making contact with the bullet. Yeah, see, I can turn the seating stem or turn the adjustment right now. Turn it down until I feel resistance. There it is. So that wasn't too far. I'm going to drop the ram a little bit and then go down maybe 50. And we'll see where that puts us. So yeah, right now the bullet's just barely in there. And it's right at 2.8 inches. So let, let's make a huge adjustment here, 180. Okay, that's 180 thousandths. Let's see if that puts us close. Two point six three one. That's about ten thousandths long. Now these bullets in particular have got pretty open and irregular hollow points, so we're going to see a lot of total overall length variation just from that. So let's see the second one and then compare it. Two point six three one. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and come down eleven thousandths. I think that last one was two point six three one as well, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm gonna go down eleven thousandths and call it good. And then run these first two back through before moving on to the other three. Okay, that's our first five rounds of 6.5 PRC. Okay, done with accurate 5744. It goes off the table and IMR4451 is next. So this time the charge weight's 54 grains and the process is exactly the same. So I'm not gonna make you sit through every charge weight here, 
but I'll keep you updated if interesting things happen. So I decided to weigh out all of my charges before I seat any more bullets. And I'm just about done. I'm down to my last powder of uh, Rotumbo. And I don't have a lot of experience with Rotumbo, but I was getting ready to pour some out here and I noticed a big clump. Let me pour out some of the loose stuff, maybe. There you go, you see how clumpy that is? I did some searching and apparently this is really common with Rotumbo. So I just shook the can a bunch to try and unclump it. Looks like that's worked. Me interested to see, you know, what our velocities look like and if they're consistent. So we'll see how that goes. So all right, five more charges to weigh out and then we'll seat some more bullets. So the first load with Accurate 5744, obviously lots of empty case, 15 grains less than most of our other charge weights, but all of the others, it was pretty consistently good. I don't think any of these are going to be compressed or if they are, it'll be very lightly. So I need to back off our adjustment a bunch, a whole bunch. And our next row is the 107 grain Sierra Match King. So that is a 2.850. Overall length is our target. So let's see, see where this puts us. We definitely seeded the bullet a little bit. So I'm 135,000 short or 134,000 short or long, I'm sorry. Okay, so I just dialed in exactly 134. And if my math was correct, this should be 2.850, a little bit long. Let's see the next one and see what it gives us before we make any adjustment. 2.855, so I'm gonna go ahead and come down five and roll with that. Now I really should get out my Hornady bullet comparator and take notes about what the cartridge based O-Drive measurement is on these, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, no problems with the 107 grain Match King. Back the adjustment back out and move on to the 120 grain ELD Match. Okay, here's another test for our micro adjustment. 2.990, that's 140 thousandths long. So there's 50, there's 100, and there's 40. So this should come out perfect. Pretty close, two and a half thousandths, two and a half thousandths long. And then that one's three thousandths long. I want to go ahead and come down three. And, and we'll run with that. Yep, 2.850. Okay, next is the 123 grain Lapua Sinar. 2.915 is what I'm after. Well, crap. I went a little bit too short on this one, 2.895 or 894. So that's 20 thousandths shorter than I was planning. But the number I was originally planning on, I was using it because it was 20 thousandths off the lands. I'm just gonna stick with this. I'm gonna change my notes and say, we're shooting 40 thousandths off the lands today. Because otherwise I need to pull this bullet, next size it again, like it's a whole thing. I'm not in the mood. Okay, the notes are corrected and I'm moving on. Maybe it'll shoot better at 40,000 to jump instead of 20. All right, this time I'm going, I'm gonna back out a lot. So this is the 130 grain burger hybrid. My 6.5 Creedmoor AR-10 absolutely loves this 130 grain burger. So hopefully this gun will as well because an extremely awesome viewer sent me four, uh, four boxes of them. So we've got some to play with. All right, next up is the 135 grain A tip. Yeah, so it looks like our 135 grain A tip is getting scuffed up just a little bit, a little bit of a, little bit of a ring around it, but I don't think it's deforming the bullet at all. I'll have to pick up that VLD stem. I think they're 20 bucks, so might as well have it. 
So with each bullet, I've been given one a shake and they all definitely have some case capacity left. All right, 140 grain spear gold dot. Really like this bullet as well. It's been an outstanding shooter in 6.5 Creedmoor and I killed a couple deer with this bullet. They did a really good job. They look, they look great when they expand, lots of weight retention. Okay, 2.930. Okay, next is the 142 grain Sierra Match King. If I'm remembering correctly, it's been a while since I've shot this bullet in Creedmoor. And I think I had kind of some mixed results, but I know a lot of others like this bullet, so. Hopefully it does a good job. I need to get, need to get a box of those 150 grainers to try. Almost forgot to back out my seating stem that time because this is the 143 grain ELDX. We've got some factory ammo with this bullet and it seemed to be shooting pretty good in my barrel swap video. So hopefully it'll, it'll do even better with hand loads. So this, this was 57 grains of IMR 8133. And I think this one had the most case fill, but still got some, still got some powder moving. All right, now I think this 147 grain ELD match, can't remember if this is the same ogive. We might be able to basically use the same die setting, but let's just go out 50 and see where that puts us. That's where 45 thousandths off, so pretty close. They would have been within five thousandths of each other if we didn't even move the die. Better safe than sorry, right? Okay, last one. And finally, finally, managed to get some ammo done. Holy crap, let's get to the range. I feel like the reloading gods owe us a good range trip, you know? Like good groups, no problems, promising accuracy, all of that. So we are at 100 yards. I have the shot marker electronic target system running up there at the top. And if I don't have technical issues, we should have a target camera right over there. So this is a Savage 110 Precision. The 6.5 PRC barrel has a one in eight twist. It's a 24 inch barrel. This is a Vortex Viper HS scope that's on 24 power, Silencer Co. Omega 36M suppressor, and lab radar chronograph to get our velocities. You'll also see velocity show up on the shot marker system up there. At the top in the center, it gives you each shot. And then over in the top right, you'll see an average and an SD. Those are target velocities. So that's sometimes confusing. I want to start out with a quick group with the Hornady Precision Hunter factory ammo. It uses the 143 grain ELDX, and this seemed to be shooting pretty good whenever we were doing the initial test firing of the gun after the barrel swap. I guess we could also see if this will load out of the magazine. This gun's always been a little bit of a pain in the butt to load off the magazine. So the amount of empty space we've got in front of the rounds in the magazine is a little bit ridiculous. So what in the world's gonna be happening to these during recoil, I wonder? Yeah, I just smacked it and they all just pushed to the front. I'm wondering if there's some sort of spacer or maybe a, another style of magazine I'm supposed to be using or if all this empty space is normal. We'll start out with just three of them in there. See what happens. That was kind of the same way it was with my 300 Win Mag. And it might just be because I'm, you know, working the bolt too slowly here, here at the bench, but. Yeah, it's mostly working. Let's get to shooting.
All right, that's a good start. That's a really good start. It's at 0.82 inches. And this first shot was a stone cold gun, no warm up. So what was it without that one? 0.51 inches. Good deal, man. That's, uh, that's pretty good stuff for some factory ammo, if you ask me. So the average velocity was 3,018 feet per second with a standard deviation of 17.8. Okay, before we move on to hand loads, I wanna shoot some of this Hornady match. This is the 147 ELD match. Now, in the last video, these were going all over the place. I'm talking four or five inches. So I'm wanting to give it another try. I don't know what was going on in that last video, whether it was just from having the gun completely apart and together, we were making big scope adjustments. Maybe the scope was going a little crazy. I had a, I had a scope when I was a kid that was that way, just a piece of crap, you know, $30 Tasco scope that I had on a rifle. And you'd make an adjustment and then you'd have to shoot it once or twice for the crosshair to actually move. And then you were good. I've got quite a few of these scopes and never had that problem with these. So I doubt that's what was going on, but who knows? All right, I'll tell you what, let me clear shot marker first. And I wanna keep shooting at that same dot because we're, we're kind of short on dots here today. Got a lot of different loads to shoot. So let's see what happens here. Okay, that's not so bad. I mean, it's bad, but it's not, it's not like we saw. The average velocity was 2931, standard deviation 18.8. .8. Okay, let's move on to some fun stuff. I should probably give the gun a minute to cool because the re recoil feels amazing. You know, I guess my brain is so used to feeling 300 Win Mag recoil whenever I'm sitting behind, you know, this particular gun. But yeah, it feels good, feels light. And because of that, I'm probably gonna need to be more careful about barrel heat than I otherwise would be. Feels pretty good. I did leave my suppressor cover off today. Got a little bit of a breeze, so Mirage shouldn't be bad, or at least suppressor Mirage shouldn't be bad, and it'll help it cool down a lot quicker. All right, let's start out with our goofy load, the 85 grain Sierra Varminer with that little 40 grain charge of accurate 5744. I mean, I have to assume our zero is gonna be off pretty far, but we'll see. We'll just shoot at the next dot over. Please don't blow my face off. Okay, velocity on that shot was 34.30. I forgot to write down what it's supposed to be. That sounds good enough. The brass looks good. The neck's a little bit smoky. We can have a look at that when we get back to the bench, but I did load this in Hornady brass that was already dirty, so that may be part of it. There was very little recoil as well. All right, let's see if it groups. Those last three shots really stacked in there nicely. So overall 1.14 inch group. Let's see what those last three were. Yeah, last three went into 0 0.31 inches. I'm definitely calling that group a win. Because like that's really, really neat. Velocity was 3448, standard deviation 14.1. Doing that with accurate 5744 just blows my mind. Okay, moving right along. This is the 107 grain Sierra Match King with IMR 4451. Felt like a good shot. All right, that's just ugly. Yeah, so that's a 2.26 inch group. Velocity was 3184, standard deviation 20.7. It wasn't even really trying to group. So I think the less, so I think the less said about this, the better. Let's move on, forget it ever happened. After a short break to let the gun cool, of course. Okay, moving right along. Next is the 120 grain Hornady ELD match with H4831SC. This is my Grendel's favorite bullet. That load felt kind of stout, like, cause Bolt lift was a little bit, I won't say it was hard, but 
there was a bit of resistance on bolt lift. Looks like it was kind of trying to group, but we ended up at 1.12 inches. Velocity was 31.38, standard deviation 8.9. Hoping for a little bit better, but a little bit of promise there. So next is the 123 grain Lapua Sinar with Reloader 23. We'll screw it up. Screwed it up a little? Yeah, just a little. Okay, so this is more like what we're hoping for. 0.81 inches. Let's see what it was without that first shot. Yeah, 0 0.40 without the first shot. Our velocity was 3,052 feet per second. Standard deviation was 6.0. I was starting to get worried, man. I was about to say it earlier, like, if we end this day and our best group is with frickin' factory ammo, I might just give up. But see, this group, that's why you don't speak that sort of evil. You gotta trust that things are gonna get better, I guess. Okay, so we've got five more dots and six more groups. So I need to take some little pasty stickers down there. Yeah, I'll cover up that center group, that big old nasty, yeah, two and a quarter inch group. We'll cover that up. Okay, back over here to this center dot. Okay, next is the 130 grain Burger Hybrid OTM Tactical with H1000. So another thing I meant to mention, the last group in this group are where we switched over to the new Norma Brass. So the first three groups of hand loads were with the Hornady. So this is all Norma, or Nosler, I'm sorry, Nosler Brass. So that's not terrible, 0.95 inches. This guy up here that messed up our sticker also messed up our group. It's a very nice 0.69 inch four, four shot group. So the velocity was 3,058 feet per second and standard deviation was 8.3. So the barrel's keeping pretty cool pretty easily. That's good. So we need to move down to the bottom row. And next up is the 135 grain Hornady ATIP with Vitavori N565. Okay, that's not too bad for the ATIP, 0.86 inches. Velocity was 2870 with standard deviation of 12.2. So one thing I've noticed about the new Nosler brass is that some of them are, are pretty tight. Like it's taking a little bit of crush or whatever to get them all the way in there. And I think that's headspace related because I went a little shorter than I should have on, on my headspace. I should probably see it as a good thing because this fire forming is not having to deal with the excess headspace. All right, time for a little break to let the gun cool. I'll tell you what, the wind has been gusty and I've needed to wait it out quite a bit, which is fine, you know, it's been helping to keep the gun cool and all that. But as, of course, as I'm about to take a break, it's like dead calm. That's all right, that, this is just one of those videos. Okay, so I'm back from a little bit of an extended break. The gun's pretty much totally cooled down now. So we're moving on to the 140 grain gold dot with Reloader 26. So 0 0.90 inches, I'm ready for deer season. The velocity was 29.55 with an 11.6 standard deviation. Okay, moving on to the 142 grain Sierra Match King with IMR 7977. I really like this powder in 300 wind mag. Don't screw it up.
Shot felt great. Oh, nice, 0.69 inches. What was it before that? Oh, 0 0.40. Yeah, that, that does hurt a little. It felt like a great shot. So the first shot, so, so the average velocity was 27.95, but standard deviation is 34.3, really, really bad. And our first shot was the lowest by 40 feet per second at 27.43. So best group of the day gives the most confusing or unexpected velocity statistics. It's just how life goes sometimes, I guess. So next is the 143 grain ELDX with IMR 8133. So this, this is the same bullet that we shot in the factory ammo that shot a pretty good group. So let's see how our loads do. Listen, folks, I don't know how any of this crap works. 1.84 inches. Where did that come from? Velocity was 28.28. Standard deviation, 10.7. Extreme spread, 28. Very weird. All right, one more to go, but I need to give the gun a couple minutes. Okay, five shots left, and they're with the 147 grain ELD match and Rotumbo. That one was wanting to group. See what it was without the first shot. Yep, four shots into 0.56 inches, but that first one was way out there, 1.37 inches. So velocity was 27.90, standard deviation 10.4. Tell you what, I'm pretty happy with today's results. That 142 grain Sierra Match King was good. And with the 143 ELDX, I mean, we know the bullet can shoot because the factory ammo shoots well. So we just gotta find a friendlier powder for that guy and get rid of that little guy with the 147. There's a lot to work with here. We've got work to do on the reloading process, but the gun seems okay. All right, let's get packed up, get back to the bench. Okay, let's have a look at the brass. These two pieces are from the first load with accurate 5744. I was talking about the necks seemed a bit smoky, so let's compare it to the next one, IMR 4451, it's the same. Yeah, so that that's just from the cases being dirty. Now the primers on this brass are cratered a little bit, and they're all cratered. This gun just does that, does it with factory ammo, does it with all of my hand loads. Did the same thing as 300 Win Mag, so same bolt, same primer craters. Otherwise everything looks good. Now hopefully I can get this to show up, but some of the brass, the, the nozzle especially, got some shiny spots around the case head. Like nothing crazy. I think these were the pieces where I needed to crush them in a little bit. That bolt just didn't quite want to go home and squeezing it in there left, left a little bit of that. I think that might be the source because it was intermittent and happened on a bunch of different loads. So nothing to freak out about, I don't think. So overall, I'm pretty pleased. There's another look at our best group. That was the 142 grain Sierra Match King with IMR 7977. And then this group here was with the 123 grain Lapua Sinar. Yeah, that was 0.81 inches. And that was the 0.69. Another thing I wanted to check. So if you remember back to Rotumbo, this is the one that had all of the clumps in it. And our velocity was 2790 with a standard deviation of 10.4. And looking on the Hodgton load data, the vol velocity looks just about correct. So it doesn't look like that clumping caused us any problems. So really, I mean, this die was our only issue. And I've been trying to decide what to do with it. You know, from, from looking at it in the bore scope and seeing like those brass flakes and some of the brass coloration, I really would like to go in and get that out of there, maybe polish it up with some, some light abrasive stuff and see what happens. But I know the smart move is to just call Redding and let them deal with it. So I just ran a poll on my community tab with no other details except I've got a brand new die that I think is bad, what should I do? Or what would you do? And right now, 82% say let the manufacturer take care of it. And 18% say pull out the lapping, grinding, polishing compounds and try to fix. 
I felt pretty sure the pole would go that way, but I wanted to run it anyway, just to be sure. So that's my next move. See if Redding can help me out with the die. And I, I think I'm gonna order a Lee die as well, cause you know, they're 15 bucks or whatever. That way if it takes Redding a while, we'll have another die to use. And listen, I never have any luck with customer service. They'll check it, it'll be in spec, and it'll be sent back as no trouble found. That's just the way my life goes. I guess if that happens, we could do the polishing. So I think that pretty much covers it. Pretty good start to 6.5 PRC with one minor problem that we've got to get taken care of. And if you hate hearing YouTubers complain, now is the time you should leave this video. I hope you have a great day. Because man, I had some problems beyond what you saw. I got that case stuck, that first case stuck, and right about the time where I was out of ideas, I didn't know what to do, this thing was kicking my butt, I realized that I had lost all of my video footage up to that point. So those blank spaces earlier with only audio, luckily I was able to recover everything else. Well, for the most part. Well, I lost some stuff I didn't really need, but whatever, you get the idea. I lost a bunch of files, and at that point I had to stop everything because I didn't know how I was going to proceed. It was either start a separate video about removing a you know difficult stuck case and then start over on the 6.5 PRC video because you, you know I can't just start it in the middle of a bunch of problems so that's the main reason why this video is so late like you know it's supposed to go up on Sunday this is it's going to go up Thursday I really apologize but I lost a couple days with file recovery I had audio problems I'm not even going to talk about those but I had audio problems and then on top of that I had all of this die crap going on so I was freaking front row seat on the struggle bus there for a while. And that's why this video is four days late. So I apologize for that. Well, and the other problem is now it's Thursday and I've, I've got another video due on Sunday. I'm not going to do that video. I'm just not. I'm probably going to do a couple videos for my second channel, but the next reloading video will be a week from this next Sunday. So maybe that'll be some time. Maybe I'll have a lead die. I'll, I'll go ahead and do another 6.5 PRC video, or maybe I'll do something else. I'm not sure yet, but after getting through this nightmare, I need a couple days to clear my head and get my grass mode. It's like knee high. So that's where we'll leave this one. Thanks for letting me vent here for a minute. I, know, I, I hate listening to YouTubers whine as much as you do, but wanted to let you know how it all went down. It's been gnarly, but hey, didn't blow my face off. So it's a win. All right, see you guys next time.